Well, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and keep my camera on. If you wanna turn your cameras on, feel free to. But we are here chatting today about uh, developer relations and community teams working internally um, with other teams throughout your company and how that is just as important or some might say more important than working with the external communities. Um, I know I've had a number of conversations with people about this over the years and kind of the, the struggle to make sure that they are um, internally advocating for their team uh, as well as their community members and working to make sure that they're working across teams to accomplish those, those same goals. Um, but then also working to make sure that they're communicating their team goals back internally into the company so that the company understands, as well as making sure that their team goals go all the way up to uh, the overarching company goals. So I think there's a couple different directions we could take this conversation in today. Um, I'm happy to go in whatever directions you all want to and kind of let, let the conversation be driven by the questions that we have and the interesting topics to you all. Um, there is a link to the Google Doc that we're gonna be taking notes on throughout the session. Um, Amber just dropped that in chat. So feel free to hop in there and jot down notes as people are saying interesting things. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on it and trying to jot things down as well, but I will say I am not good at talking and typing at the same time. So I'll be typing while, while other people are talking and keeping up with things there. Um, does anyone have any pressing directions they want to take the conversation in first or, or a particular angle that they want to discuss from the start? Hey, Mary, this is Matt Broberg here. Hey there, how's it going? Good, good to see you. Uh, I had one thought on my mind that I just want to throw out there, see if it helps guide the direction. I'm really fascinated in the constraints of different job roles these days and what drives people towards one type of role versus another. So I'd be interested in your angle on how do you find like what the constraint is to DevRel? Like, what are they ultimately responsible for and working within? And if that's a one size fits all or something that really truly depends on the organization. That's a great question. Um, so you're talking about constraints in the idea of, you know, we're working across teams and with other people on other teams, but perhaps making sure that we're not taking on too much work or work that isn't relevant to us specifically. Is that correct? Nailed it. Exactly. Perfect. Um, anyone? I'm, I'm happy to speak to that, but I also don't want to be dominating things. Does anyone else have a comment or a thought on that? Cool, I can start things off. Um, so the question is, how do we make sure we're not taking on work that isn't DevRel, right? Um, so I think the, the biggest thing to me around making sure that we're working on, on topics and tasks that are super relevant for us is making sure that we're working in partnership with other teams, not doing work on behalf of other teams. Um, and I think that's a, there's a nuance there that's important to keep in mind. Um, but the way that I really think about that is it's less about filling gaps that the other teams could fill and more about what are our unique talents and abilities that we bring to the table that perhaps can't be accomplished by another team. Um, so things like um, writing technical tutorials about uh, integrations or things like that, that we have time to really dig into and explore uh, from a developer advocacy stand standpoint, at least. Um, where, you know, it might not be a main priority for the engineering team, but it's something that the support team brings up as an issue, or uh, maybe the sales team is talking to people and saying, hey, you know, this integration could be really useful for our prospects. Um, and that's work that we can take on and work in conjunction with support 
and with sales to make sure that we're accomplishing that in the right way and that we're approaching it from the right angle. But it's it's work that we are uniquely able to do. And so I think that's that's the first framework that I take is, is it something that the DevRel team is uniquely able to handle that another team either just doesn't have the time for or doesn't have the ability to approach from both the advocating for the community as well as advocating for the company viewpoint. Thoughts? I, I love that. Uh, I love that specification, right? Of like, you have to be working in partnership or in support of another organization as opposed to taking on tasks for them. Um, maybe, could you give an example of what that's like in practice? Because I, I feel like in practice, that can get pretty tricky to know whether you're doing work that, you know, quote unquote, just needs to get done and your team has time to do it as DevRel, or if you're, you're truly like satisfying that partnership you're, you're mapping out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we actually have a, a great example of this that we've been um, kind of navigating at Komunda a little bit. Um, we have a community marketing team um, that handles some of our like external communications and things like that. So we have, uh, we work with this person on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're the ones handling the, the newsletter and things like that. Um, and this individual doesn't have a technical background, they aren't super tech savvy. And so figuring out, you know, what articles should I include or how do I approach this conversation in the right way or what should I say about the latest release isn't necessarily their strong suit, but I want them to be able to own that newsletter and for them to not just be relying on my team or the engineering teams to really, um, provide those answers for them. And so I encourage my team to say, hey, you know, we'll we'll look it over for you after it's done, or we'll point you in the right direction to find the information that you're looking for. But we aren't necessarily going to write this whole section of the newsletter for you on a regular basis, because it's a learning opportunity for their team. And so it turns us into more mentors for our coworkers, rather than doing the work for them. Um, it's, it's the idea of teaching someone to fish rather than fishing, providing the fish for them, right? The, the old adage there. Um, and so I think that's, that's one example where that's easily something we could step in and do like, oh, well, you know, it'll take me 20 minutes to write up a paragraph about the latest release and pull all of the relevant blog posts and forum posts and everything else and help you include that in the next newsletter. And we could totally do that on an ongoing basis, but then that's one more 20 minute segment that we're doing on a monthly or weekly basis, depending on how often that newsletter is going out, rather than saying, hey, here's the right places to look for that information and on an ongoing basis. Here's the right tags in the forum to look for. Um, here's the right areas to, to go to in the blog posts. Um, set up a you know Slack channel in our company Slack where people can kind of drop links to things that might be relevant to, to include. Um, and then we're happy to, to look it over before it goes out to the community to say, uh, actually, let's mention this one instead of this one, or here's the reasoning behind mentioning this part of the release versus that part of the release and kind of guiding more than doing the actual work. Anyone disagree or have, have counterpoints or perhaps other examples of ways that they worked across teams to kind of accomplish those similar objectives? Okay, I let the awkward silence hang for enough time for it to actually be awkward there. Um, well, Mary, I'm always happy to talk to you. We, um, <laughs> we've jammed on, jammed on this topic a lot. Um, so yeah, definitely. So I guess there's got to be like a reciprocal 
interest, right? Like they're an interest in people learning what you're offering to teach them, as opposed to just asking you to get a task done. Um, that's a, a different relationship than some other teams have, right? Like it, sales just wants marketing to send them leads, you know, engineering just gets the engineering done and asks marketing to send out the messaging. So it, is DevRel special in that way or, or is it just like a different negotiation? I'm trying to think about like how this really works and how people get it in their head that that's okay, that we're a support org, not a, a service org where you just give us a task and we get the task done. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think there's, there are times when we are a service org and there are times when we are a support org and figuring out the distinction between those two takes time and energy and building relationships internally. Um, so I think knowing the, the difference between the two, like there's going to be some things that we just do on behalf of other teams, right? It might be, uh, I don't know, pulling, download metrics or keeping track of, of particular stats on a month to month basis or things like that. And then there's going to be other things that we can say, Hey, yeah, I can totally help you with that. But while I'm helping you this time, why don't we set up a call instead? So I can walk you through what I'm actually doing so that next time you can do it yourself. And there's, there are times when those conversations will be met with, yeah, sure. No problem. Sounds great. And there are other times when someone will go, no, no, I just want you to do it for me. <laughs> At which point it's, it's a matter of, you know, either having the difficult conversation of like, again, happy to have this conversation with you this time, or happy to do this on your behalf this time, but let's, let's figure out a partnership going forward or a way that I can really help you figure out how to do this yourself. Um, so I think there's, there's some relationship building that comes in handy there. Um, so that the, internal, your coworkers, your teammates, the stakeholders throughout the company aren't seeing you as a, a service. Sorry, they are seeing you as a service org, not a support org. No, they're seeing you the correct way. <laughs> I'm going to stop trying to, to differentiate there. Um, but they're seeing it as a, they're seeing DevRel community as an organization they can partner with and really grow and learn with rather than just Hey, I need you to do this thing. Cool, that's done now. Um, Jason, I saw you left a, a question in chat. Do you want you want to go ahead and walk me through that, and we can? Sure. I, you know, I was trying to figure out a way to kind of connect all the conversations. I think there's there's some there's some really different backgrounds. Like one of the the things that that's kind of different in 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 my history is that um, like I you know I was building communities for a, a company that didn't really have a developer relations team because they didn't, you know, yes, there's customers and there's customer support. Um, but like the software and, and we're developing open source software and working with open source software communities, but the software wasn't the product, right? The software just runs on the product. Um, and so it was with, there really wasn't a, the, there's, there's customer relations, but not really developer relations, um, if, if you know what I mean. And, it, and so trying to get them to, um, you know, somewhat my role to escalate things to them so that, you know, we would, would get the, you know, the, this, the community supported. Um, but a lot of times, you know, um, you know, me and my organization became more of a, um, well, you guys exist, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Um, as the as the community team, so um, you know, I'm really interested in, in, in what lessons you've learned about getting, um, you know, communicating through the company the value of engaging with them with community and and allowing them to kind of scope things in the right level, right? Because that that was always the confusion is how much should the support team spend being supporting the community versus supporting you know people identified as buying customers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really, really important part. And I think that actually, to a certain extent, plays back into what we were just talking about with how do you work across teams and help people understand that you're, you know, this is work that is valuable and work that we can do, but also then we have other work that's valuable. 
And so it's not just doing the work and working across teams, but it's showing the value of the work that you're doing, not just with, yeah. hey, here's our download stats, or hey, here's yeah. the number of developers we have on our platform, but here's the impact that that those people have. Here's the way that they're really contributing and, and giving back and the, the opportunities that this has given us as a result of us being included in these conversations. Um, so I think, I think there's a couple of things there. I would say when, a, when an organization doesn't have a DevRel team, it's almost more important for the individual who's trying to do DevRel type things or community type things to be communicating across teams. Partly because when you've got product support and you know technical sales or um, the the engineering team that's really working on the the software side of the product or those components, I think making sure that you have weekly or maybe bi-monthly meetings with those individuals who are engaging with that that developer audience is going to be incredibly important because it's not a main focus of the company, but it's a main focus for the success of that component. And so if you can figure out, you know, here's, here's the reason why it's necessary for us to keep this component up and running. And then secondly, here's the reason why we need engagement in order to keep this component up and running and how that then feeds back into the overarching product, the overarching success of the company, all of those types of answers kind of come out of that and help you really be able to prove the value of the work that you're doing, not only externally for the community, because the community can see it and they go, oh, this is amazing. This is exactly what I was hoping for, but also internally so that you can say, look, because we have a footing in this developer community, we're also able to reach these other places, which helps with the general promotion of the product, even though the general product isn't a developer product as a whole. It, it, in the end, it, it all seems like more work than actually doing it, right? And, in, and even convincing team members, you know, within the support organization to actually do the work that they need to do to support. It's easier to go to the team members. They want to support the community. It's easy to talk them into it. They do it, but then at the end of the day, they get no credit for it because, you know, the, the, it's, it's too hard to communicate the value into their org structure. Yeah, and I think that's where, well, two things. One, the relationship building, right? That it has to be internal as well as external. And the second, and I've, I've said this a handful of times before in other conversations, but a huge part of developer relations is internal public relations. So think of it as the like, you know, maybe not sending an official press release, but like, how do you amplify the work that your coworkers are doing? How do you amplify the work that your community is doing? How do you amplify the importance and the value that you're seeing internally as well as externally to make sure that other people are understanding the value of the DevRel team, but are also interested in engaging with you? And so a big part of our role, and I think for me, now that I'm managing a DevRel team, a huge part of my role is making sure that other teams throughout the company see the interesting things that we're doing and see the, in the value that those interesting things give back to the broader company, because that then intrigues them and makes them want to be involved. So that the next time my team goes to the support department, Support goes, oh yeah, hey, and this this project you worked on last week was really cool. And I read about that here. And you know, thanks for providing that summary. Of course we'll be involved because it it gives that authenticity and and trust to the projects that you're working on so that you aren't having to convince other people to be involved, but they're aware of what you're doing and want to be involved from the start. You're, you're, you're encouraging me to communicate a lot more of the what I would consider very mundane, right? Because sometimes just to keep the community going, just having somebody in the support team say hi to them and acknowledge them is enough to encourage them to keep moving forward, um, you know, knowing that they're not you're working in a vacuum. Um, and then to, to say thank you just for saying hi, you know, really 100%. could go a long way. 
Absolutely. I love that idea of communicating what we feel is mundane, right? Because we don't necessarily think it's important to say, hey, I finished this task or hey, you know, I met this community member, but being able to highlight that for other people who aren't as familiar with developer relations and aren't as familiar with what we're doing, I think is extremely important. Um, we actually have a DevRel task board for my team as a whole. Um, and last week I introduced a Trello integration with Slack that basically every time we move a, a card into the done column, it shoots a message over to um, our like ask DevRel Slack channel that's public for the company that says, hey, you know, so-and-so finished this task. Um, here's, you know, click here for more information and takes them back to the task board. But then that lets the team then, you know, in thread say, hey, thanks to, you know, this person from support and this person from engineering and this person from marketing for really helping out with this project and driving this forward. And so it lets us kind of give kudos, but also makes other teams aware of what we're doing. And since, I mean, I think that was Thursday that I introduced that. So it's been like two business days and we've already had more engagement in that channel than we've had in a while because we have people going, oh, oh, you finished that thing I didn't realize. So it makes it easier to communicate across the company what we're doing and to engage other teams. Matt said a couple of things in, in chat there. Um, do you wanna highlight those too, Matt? Or you want me to, to, to read them out loud for you? Oh, sure, I'll jump in. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking, Jason, it sounds like, uh, yeah, like there's a internal business case that maybe needs to be formalized in a way. Um, and value of community is absolutely fascinating to me and just a horrible bottomless well of challenge uh, because it's so fun to do the work, but to explain it to an organization seems to be uh, an endless task at times. But I found like focusing on an executive sponsor because ultimately organizations work through budgeting and budgeting is a function of somebody who has a budget. So figuring out whatever narrative you need to tell them and then, you know, putting the pieces together. We do a lot of work like that in the chaos community, uh, which is an open source org I'm a part of. Um, and yeah, if, if you want to jump into that and talk more, I'm always happy to. Um, and then the last thing that came to mind is that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you are the ideal community manager and you don't want to take on the task on top of that of a program management role where like you're putting together the business case that that is legit and different skills and different challenges. So finding somebody who maybe wants to take on that internal comms to complement your external comms can be really effective. 100% with that. And I think that's an important place for the manager to come into play too. Like if, if you are a team of one who's reporting up to the CMO or the CTO or the VP of product or something else, like it's extremely difficult to do the work, communicate the work, come up with the business case, make sure that's being communicated internally as well as externally. Like that's, that's a lot of jobs all in one. So I think if you're lucky enough to actually have a head of DevRel, director of DevRel, DevRel manager, something along those lines, working heavily in partnership with that manager and your team to say, hey, I think this is the business case for doing this. I think this is my reasoning for doing this. Can you help me kind of firm this up and present it in a way that other people throughout the company are going to understand is a really, really valuable um, asset and, and ally to have. Um, if you don't have that, I would encourage you to find people throughout the industry who are figuring out how to do that as well. And maybe you've got a group that you can meet with every couple of weeks to just say, cool, here's the projects that I'm working on. How do I prove that, that internal business value to other people? And I think, I mean, I could talk about business value develop relations all day. Um, I have a book about it. <laughs> I could literally talk about it all day. Um, but I think that's, that's a, a really important piece that we forget so often um, is that, you know, if you don't know the business value for what you're doing, why are we doing it? Like, how do you, how do you prioritize things? How do you figure out what to do next? 
how do you justify the work that you're doing um, when someone else comes down and says, hey, show me some metrics, show me the value of what you're working on. And so I think that partly goes back to the executive sponsorship that Matt, you were just talking about um, with making sure that you've got someone who really believes in what you're doing and understands the value of what you're doing and partnering with them to make sure that you can paint that picture internally as well. Mike, you said something about plus one for communication. I'd love to hear some examples of um, how, how that has benefited you in your working with your sales department specifically. Yeah, I mean, like, so one of the big things that has, you know, really helped with us is um, kind of just having a random channel where we just like post the random updates from the DevRel team, myself and you know, another colleague of mine. And we just post like, hey, sales folks, we, um, we built this demo or we have this new version of a product we're releasing just to keep them, you know, interested. And if it hits any major pain points that they constantly hear, you know, having that conversation uh, just like out in this channel and then they're like, oh, well, well what, what else is there? Um, what else can we talk about or what else are you working on? Uh, we have whatever number of calls where this is a problem that they're trying to face and having just just posting those random updates just kind of you know out just putting it out there into the ether um and then just be making it a regular thing has just really helped grow the communication and feedback cycle between sales trying to figure out what do we actually need to know and what can we do to help our clients and then having us uh, as DevRel find out, okay, what are some things that we should be working on or what are some common problems? Um, as it can be pretty easy to like get lost in what do the average users, uh, what are the problems that average users face and um, you know, are, we, are we too far removed from that? I love that, I love that. And I love that it's opening up further discussions. I love that other people are asking questions about it and that it's, stopped being just a let me talk to you and turned into a let me talk with you um, and encourage you to to participate in what we're doing yeah awesome um other thoughts questions areas people want to take the discussion hey mary i just wanted hey John, to how's it going? oh it's going all right how are you doing Doing all right. I just wanted to verbalize a note that I put into the Google Doc, which is, um, you know, at GitLab, one thing we're trying, um, you know, going forward is to have essentially budgets for our internal stakeholders. So um, other teams in marketing and also, you know, kind of other teams outside of marketing will each have a budget and we have a scoring system that we created. And the hope is that uh, by implementing these limits, we'll kind of force these stakeholders to prioritize their requests for our team um, rather than our team doing the prioritization when we're often one step removed. So you can imagine if you're, you know, a field marketer and you know that you only have, you know, say 20 kind of budget points um, for a quarter rather than kind of sending everything to DevRel and letting us do the prioritization, we're hoping that they'll do the prioritization and making sure that they only send us, say, the top you know, seven or eight S um, for the quarter. I love that idea. I think it's a really cool way to kind of say, here's, here's how we're prioritizing things and why, so that other people understand, you know, here's the priorities of the DevRel team, of the community team, and, and what we can request from them and how to, how to actually handle that. I'd love to hear, do you have, um ways for like official ways for people to make those requests or is it all kind of one-off conversations that happen throughout the quarter yeah so um i think you're familiar with this because of the work that you did with gitlab commit but um at gitlab we use issues for kind of tracking everything and so we have issue templates for requests that have you know labels um and then there's also kind of like a weighting to those issues so depending on you know whether the request is for say brand new, you know, content um, that we don't, you know, haven't yet prepared will be kind of a higher score against your budget than asking someone to come and do like a one hour 
um, Q and A with the team where there's no material that needs to be repaired or delivering a talk that they've already um, delivered in other kind of venues or forums. Um, so that's the the process that we have, you know, these issue requests and then um, a score based on the type of content that folks are requesting. And that that'll be kind of, you know, deducted from their quarterly budget as their requests come in. Awesome. I love that. I love that. So it's a new kind of thing. Um, you know, as everything that we do at GitLab is completely open. So I can even, I'll link to the merge request. Um, that's going to yeah, add please. this to our handbook in the docs. And I would love for folks on this call to take a look at it and leave um, feedback if they have any thoughts on how we can improve that process. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Anyone else have questions or comments or directions you'd like the conversation to go in next? Cool. I know for me, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, how, how teams are communicating, not just what they're working on, but the, um, you know, uh, feedback they're hearing from the community or um, kind of how they're, how they're communicating with other teams as a whole. Are you using Slack? Are you using um, collaborative docs? Are you using things like GitLab or GitHub to, to share those issues? Um, is there any sort of official feedback loop? How, how in general are you kind of having these conversations in a way that to make, in a way that makes sure that they're documented? I started to type out my response, but it may be just replying um, might be better because, you know, I think we all have to deal with these, um, you know, these, the ways of collaborating. I know we use, um, we do use Slack heavily and I'm personally really embarrassed about it because um, it's not open source. Um, and, um, you know, we, our, our official channels are through email and IRC, um, but, somewhat de facto, we've ended up using Slack um, to kind of create a, 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 a somewhat unintended two-tier um, uh, environment where kind of our lead community developers show up in the, in the Slack and there's less noise and the noobs show up in IRC. Um, and, you know, and we, we have critical mass in the IRC, but um, it's not where a lot of the real development dis discussion gets done. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I hate it. I, I just, I don't like having that hierarchical sort of thing and, and using non-open tools. That's an interesting, interesting point that it makes me think of is that if there's no documentation or communication between those two tools, then there's no way to kind of close that loop and make sure that people are aware of what's going on. Yeah, because um, it's only because yeah, you'll have communication totally separate from each one, um, and then they only they only meet in the the Git repos and the, the Git issues list, right? So, um, and somebody will be kind of left out of the discussion when they see something and like, hey, well, you know, glad this happened, but where'd this come from? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think. Uh, going a bit broader for a second, I think there's a lot of companies that are experiencing this for the first time, right? Not just with their communities, but like people who are used to having these conversations one off in the office as they pass each other. And they're now suddenly going, wait, I don't pass you in the office every day. How do I actually get that information? <laughs> How do I go beyond just, hey, we're hopping on a quick Zoom call for five minutes, but make sure that that's communicated to the rest of the team as well. Yeah. Anyone else? Feel free to unmute yourself and just and just speak up. Um, Gordon, you just said there's a lot of fragmentation in chat tools. I completely agree. Uh, do you have a way that you're kind of circumventing that or Not solving really. that issue? Okay. Not really. Um, I mean, the problem is is you, is you sort of say you know, Jason was just saying you know, you know IRC is open source, all that. 
you know, would much prefer to use that. But if you tell, you know, if you tell sort of your ran your random people, uh, you know, oh no, you have to use IRC. That's the only you know tool we use to chat with. They're going to be sort of like, yep, sign R C. You, um, yeah. So I, I don't. I mean, I don't have a good answer. I mean, there must be at least three different uh, chat tools that are widely used at Red Hat. So, yeah. Then there's Gitter, and then there's Discord, and then there's yeah. you know, and and all of them have relevant discussions. Right. You know. Yeah. It's... Yeah. I mean, I'm probably not even aware of some of the uh, you know of some of the tools used at Red Hat because I'm not in. The specific communities that you know that use them. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a 20th century nightmare that, like, you know, has only been aggravated in the last 20 years. It, it's it's yeah. Um, yeah. Well, at least with IM for a while, we had something like uh, what was it, Trillium or something like that that kind yeah, of tied Trillium. them together. But now yes. you've got Slack, you've got Google Chat, you've got IRC, you've got Discourse. And people use what they're familiar with, and it's just a mess. And yeah, we're only talking about the synchronous. Involved. And we're only talking synchronous communication, which uh, naturally yeah. bounds people by their geography and ends up bifurcating your communities. So, I mean, when we break into asynchronous and wikis um, or discourse as an alternative, it, it, it just gets absolutely massive. Um, it's a really fun topic to try to map, but uh, I found like it's impossible to get everybody to one place, but by advertising a default choice, you can often drive people there. If people aren't being driven to that default choice, you've made a choice that is inconvenient for a majority of your community and you have to reconsider your, your decision-making around that. Um, I really prefer to default to open source as well. Uh, thank goodness element.io, formerly riot.im, is becoming a really great client, uh, server client config for IRC users, as well as, you know, those that are on ma the matrix system. Um, but even with that said, like, you're going to have people on Slack, and that's okay in my book. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll stop there. But there, there's a, a lot of mapping work to do there, and... Um, it's, it's a pretty big topic. I'd love to dig into it. Yeah, I think that could be a whole whole session about that itself. Um, I'd love to circle back though. There's an interesting point, Matt, you just said it'll bifurcate your community sometimes. Um, Gordon, you mentioned the fragmentation of chat, tool, chat tools causes a lack of communication as a whole. Um, and then, um, John or Jason or somebody mentioned at the beginning um, that you know there's there's pros and cons of having things in different places, but it sounds like we don't really have a, a singular place we can point people back to to say here's here's what's going on here's what we're doing, and maybe that's where you know we're back to the maybe you have a program manager in your team who's responsible for communicating that you know, succinctly back to the company um, and having a way to have a singular place that people can see, here's the curated feedback from the community or here's the um, the the Cliff Notes version and here's where you can go to learn more about that. Because I think that's an important part of our role as community managers isn't just you know, sending the flood of feedback back to the, the product and engineering teams, but it's it's making sure that we've curated that feedback in a way that that is um, consumable by our coworkers. So that they not only understand here's the direct feedback, but here's the reason why this feedback at this point in time is particularly important. Thoughts, questions, ways that people have solved that for their teams? I mean, I love the point that communication ends up growing organically and we, we make 
kind of default choices by accident based on whatever's in trend, Slack being the biggest trend these days. Uh, and then, you know, you get kind of stuck there. There's like a gravity to it for sure. Um, but that said, like, yeah, you can with intention change that narrative and draw people someplace. The single greatest strategy I've had there is that you can draw people to new places really if and only if you're reducing the other channels they have to check. Like adding an N plus one is a nightmare to people. It's just another thing to check. But if you're saying we will officially stop using the three mailing lists we're using and this Discord server and this IRC channel, if you all come to discourse, uh, you can end up drawing people to one place and start to normalize that. But I, I think it's it's often underestimated how challenging it is to get people to communicate uh, consistently. So um, I, I guess the short version is don't trivialize that and make sure you research and put it together as a, as a proposal for people. Absolutely. And maybe, maybe that's a point of value that we provide to our internal colleagues, right? Is cool. As a community manager, as a dev advocate, as a DevRel professional, we're responsible for herding all of those cats and making sure that, you know, all of the different places are taken care of. But something that we do as a team is on a weekly basis, we'll curate all of the feedback that we're getting come up with a, you know, a miniature report of here's the feedback that was reported this week. Here's the, the customers or community members or people who are encountering these issues and the reasons why it's super important. And we maybe then prioritize that, that feedback in a way that's consumable by the other departments. And so maybe that's an avenue of communication where we can truly show here's here's the value that we provide you. We're keeping you from having to go to the three different mailing lists and the Slack and the IRC and Element and all of these different places because you don't have time to aggregate that. But that's something that that our team can do on your behalf. And that I think takes us back also to the original conversation about you know how do we make sure that we're focused on work that is meaningful and important for the DevRel team. I think that might be one of the most meaningful things, even though it feels far more um, tedious than some of the other work that we do perhaps, but we have the unique ability to say, this is incredibly valuable, or this is a pattern that I'm seeing, or this is something that keeps coming up that we really need to address because now it's not you know, one person saying it, it's five people saying it, and four out of five of those are not only open source users, but also enterprise customers and, you know, making that making that case for it because we're keeping track of all of those moving pieces on a regular basis. Any closing thoughts from folks? Well, Mary, where do you recommend we continue the conversation? Sure. Thanks for the, the nice segue there, Matt. That wasn't <laughs> even planned. <laughs> um, so there's been a few other folks that are posting comments in the Google Doc, which I love. Um, feel free to follow up there with more information too. Um, we can also connect asynchronously online um, if you're doing this type of work professionally on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm a little bit biased, but we have the, the DevRel Collective on Slack that has been around for five, six years now. Um, and a lot of these conversations take place there on a regular basis as well. So feel free to, to send in an application there if you're not already there and we'll, we'll get you added in there for more conversations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop some notes in the key insights. I saw someone dropped one there already. Feel free to, to jump in and add your own key insights as well. And we'll circle back to those at the closing session today. But thanks for joining me here today, everyone. This is a fun conversation. Thank you. We'll see you all later. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. And the next talk um, will be starting in about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, um, and that's going to be measuring community health. So I hope that you'll also uh, join um, that session. Mary, if you could put the link to that DevRel Collective into the document so those who may not know where to find that um, can also have that link um, in the notes as well.
And sure, I just dropped it in chat that? too. So thanks so much.